we hope um, that this presentation, that this lecture will be interesting to everyone. And uh, it will be posted on YouTube after maybe for two days. And it will be available. And also, I want to say that uh, this lecture, The Military Revolution in Central Europe, uh, will be provided by uh, Dr. Krzysztof Szoromi in the frame of the Collegium Carpaticum and uh, supported by International Visegrad Fund. So, dear Krzysztof, we're glad to see you, to hear you, and waiting with passion uh, for starting of your lecture. Thank you very much, Alexandra, for the kind words and the introduction. Uh, before I start, the, the first and very important question, uh, can the uh, slides be seen? So do you see the slides here? The, which yes. I shared everything. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. yes. Perfection. We see it on the full screen. Okay, perfection. And everyone, everyone can hear me? Yes. Okay, so... Uh, once again, thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction. I hope I will be worthy of it with the with the this lecture and later on with the uh, one at uh, one p.m. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone, who joined us today on this uh, fine, little bit cold but fine day. Uh, as uh, you could see on the poster and the introduction, uh, I would talk about the military revolution uh, within the framework of uh, Central Europe. So without any further ado, let's just jump straight in. Uh, the main topics of the lecture, which I would like to show, introduce uh, at this point, uh, would be the historiography of the military revolution. Now, I would say that the basic historiography is quite broad, so I would just show the basics of it, the most important works, uh, which tackled the, the issue, which started the whole uh, debate of military revolution, and uh, raised several questions, and basically identified the, the topic itself. Then I would like to talk about the definitions and the academic debates it has raised and which still can cause even to this uh, very day. <coughs> Sorry. And for the second half of my lecture, I would like to talk about the so-called military cultural transfer. What is actually a cultural transfer and can we actually interpret and analyze the military revolution as a sort of cultural transfer, not just within the global framework, but also in the Central European framework as well. And for this, I uh, prepared a little little case study, uh, the Polish-Hungarian slash Transylvanian uh, military transfer as an example, which can uh, we see as a focus point to analyze the whole uh, question at hand. At first, uh, no lecture is complete without some historiography. So I will do the exact same thing. Now, as I mentioned, the historiography is quite broad. So there's a lot of works, a lot of books and uh, articles written about the military revolution. And uh, mostly I prepare this lecture for uh, students who are interested in the topic. So I welcome them uh, especially, but also colleagues who are also uh, interested. I really hope I could say something new about the, the uh, topic, but uh, overall I uh, address this as a sort of uh, compilation slash introduction to this whole uh, debate and uh, idea. Now the works, the historiography and the, the academic works are a couple of decades old. Despite this, they, we have a wide variety of, of uh, academics, writers, and uh, lectures uh, of this topic. The first one was that was published in light of military revolution was of course Michael Roberts's uh, book in the in 1955 uh, titled uh, the military revolution uh, 1560 up to 1660 uh, now this was basically the the introductionary work the the father of this whole uh, theory it was of course based on his lecture at belfast university uh, a couple of years earlier this one was the basis the, this contained the basic theories the basic ideas and this one that was either confirmed or expanded or write out this disputed in the later decades and is still uh, as a, a vital work uh, within the topic of military revolution 
Then we have Andrew Ayton's work uh, from the 1990s, uh, both articles and books we have uh, published as well. Now, Andrew Ayton is very interesting because he immediately well, immediately in the 1990s, so he expanded the uh, framework of military revolution not to the early modern period but to the late Middle Ages. Uh, he writes about the basically the earlier states of military revolution, the roots of it in early medieval and early modern uh, Europe, mostly up till the uh, 14th, 15th uh, century predecessors of the 16th century military revolution. And he also published a work within the within the Hungarian framework as well, the, in the, with the title Katonai Forradalom a XIX századi Angliában, the military revolution in 14th century England. So he was very passionate, not just about medieval Western European history, but also he was very much interested in the uh, medieval Hungarian military history uh, as well. A couple of uh, works uh, would suggest that uh, as well. Uh, Jeremy Black's work, again in the 1990s, was very important regarding the topic and also in the uh, early 2000s. Now we can see also a tendency that in the 1990s a lot of uh, academic works are published regarding the military revolution, be it either, as I said, articles or uh, broader uh, monographies, publications, books, and, and whatnot. So Jeremy Black is one of those people who joined in uh, this uh, debate and uh, topic in the early 1990s, but also continued it in the 2000s. David Ellis also published his work in 1995. Uh, Clifford J. Rogers, again, another important figure within this whole academic uh, debate, published his work in 1995 and uh, in, in 1993. And then we have another key figure uh, within the within the topic, Geoffrey Parker himself, who actually brought up the subject and uh, was a key figure in the in the whole debate, whole academic debate of military revolution in a global sense. He published his work, The Military Revolution: A Myth. Uh, in the Journal of Modern History in 1976. Now, this was basically the indicator of the of the academic debates. It was a very important uh, publication from him, and he also uh, published in 1988 uh, his book, The Military Revolution, Military Innovation and Rise of the West from 1500 to 1800. Now, this is a very important book. It's uh, seen several re, uh, revised editions. So he published it in 1988, then in 1999. And I think he, he, it, uh, it lived for uh, revised editions. So it's a very popular, very important work. And it's, it's continued to be of important work in this whole subject. And then in the 2000s, again, he uh, published his uh, works uh, regarding the military revolution. So Geoffrey Parker is a very active and well-written figure within not just in the early modern uh, medieval, uh, sorry, military history, but also the military revolutions, uh, academic debate and the history of military revolution uh, as well. And we also have uh, other academics such as Michael Duffy from the 1980s, but also we have Hungarian academics who not just uh, wrote in the Anglo-Saxon sphere, so the early historians here were from the from the Western Europeans, so mostly British historians, but we can also see American historians uh, tackling the subject, but we can see Central Europe taking its part in the military history uh, debate or the military history um, idea, such as Kalanik Jozef or Jozef Kalanik. He wrote uh, uh, his article regarding the military revolution and its phenomenons in Europe and in the Kingdom of Hungary in the second half of the 16th century in 1997. Then we have uh, Gabor Agoston, who uh, broadened the military revolution question not just to Central Europe but also to the Ottoman Empire as well. It is uh, uh, It was a heated debate whether or not the Ottomans had elements of the military revolution and uh, their series of defeats in the 17th century were the were because of their, uh, let's just say, backwardness and obsolete nature of the military. Uh, Agoston Gabor uh, tackled this uh, topic whether or not the Ottomans had the modernization uh, in a similar fashion that Western and uh, or Central Europe uh, did. So it is a very important framework to broaden the whole framework of that uh, topic, as I mentioned. Then we have Zoltan Peter Bagi, who uh, in the 2000s also published his work. And uh, also we must mention Janos B. Sabo's uh, publications 
within this matter. One of the latest one is from 2018, uh, when he writes about the misunderstood military revolution. So he mostly he addresses some of the myths, some of the interpretations, and and basically the academic debates surrounding the military revolution uh, question. And again, we should mention uh, one of our later publication from from 2019. Uh, on the which was titled uh, on the Uiko Sakota Aranso on the border of the new era, which uh, talks about the military structures uh, and uh, armies of Europe, Central Europe, and uh, Eastern Europe and Western Europe during the well early 16th century, so before the Battle of, of Bohaj of, of uh, 1526, so basically the time of the supposed. Uh, active period of the military uh, revolution. So immediately we can see how popular the topic is. What is definitely important that that uh, the military history aspects were not very popular uh, in the earlier decades. The question and debate of military revolution actually popularized in, in, in this sense. So there was a lot of academic works uh, we can see. So I could make a, a, a separate lecture regarding only the uh, writings and, and the publications, but that would be uh, a little bit dry for, for this presentation, but overall nonetheless interesting. And of course, we should mention a couple of uh, Central European historians as well. I mentioned Hungarian ones, of course, Polish uh, and Czech and German historians also addressed the, the subject. Uh, we can see the list of public publications uh, here. Uh, in advance, I would like to apologize because my Polish uh, is not the best, so uh, sorry in, in forward. But we have um, Azibeta uh, Olzacka, uh, who published uh, work uh, regarding the military revolution, uh, not just in uh, Europe, but also, or, or Western or Central, but also uh, the effects it also had on the Russian sphere uh, as well. So immediately it's a connecting bridge between the, the Western idea and the, let's just say, Eastern uh, idea. Uh, so this is also fairly young work published in 2016. And then you also have uh, a couple of works published uh, in Polish sphere and also in Czech uh, sphere. Uh, Peter Wolmuth's uh, work was published regarding the, the fortifications and fortress building in time of the military revolutions. It was published in 2015. And then you also have uh, or Ger rep Germany represented here. Uh, I've, I, of course, could have mentioned several other, but I mentioned uh, Sebastian Buchweiser's uh, work, the military revolution, the Fuhr neue Zeit am Beispiel der französischen Religionskriege. It was published in 2008. So, shortly, the military revolution of the time period in light of the uh, French religious wars uh, as well. So he, he mentioned not just the English uh, schools, not just the Northern European school, but the French uh, aspects uh, as well. So in and of itself, we can see that the debate is of broad and from a, a very comprised space of, of Western and Northern Europe to Europe as a, a whole. I could have even mentioned that it would it broadened into Asia and the, the Far East because we have works not just about the Ottoman Empire, but of course China and, and the Japanese military revolutions. So the, the idea is expanding uh, to, a, to a, on a worldwide uh, scale uh, up to this day. Let's just talk about the uh, definition and the basic theory of military revolution. And for this, we have to go back, way back into 1955 or in the early 1950s with Michael Roberts' theory, who wrote, as I mentioned, the first publication uh, of this idea. Now, Michael Roberts in his work mentions that military revolution was based upon a widespread proliferation of firearms. So the new, quote, new technology of firearms, which was developed in the uh, high to late Middle Ages. It was more widespread in the uh, 1500s and the 1600s, and warfare was starting to get based around the use of uh, certain types of, of firearms uh, in the continent. And he mentioned the Dutch and the Swedish development of uh, new military tactics. For the Dutch school, he mentions Morris of Nassau, and for the Swedish school, he mentions Gustavus Adolphus, so the two most important figures in military reforms of the uh, early modern period, but of course they, they are well known, but they were not the only ones who had these sort of, of military reforms in their own uh, respected countries. 
Of course, he mentions the increased effectiveness of infantry over the so-called obsolete medieval style cavalry. He refers to, to heavy cavalry for this, uh, and he, base, he, he's, he bases his uh, uh, sentences and idea on the fact that Morris of Nassau abandoned uh, heavy lancers completely uh, from his army and during uh, the times of wars in, in northern and western Europe armies focused on uh, cavalry which were more, more like a mobile platform for certain types of firearms. So you had heavy cavalry but they more, were more like pistoliers than the melee uh, cavalry or shock cavalry which were very important in, in the uh, Middle Ages. So he apostrophizes uh, this, this type of Lancer cavalry as obsolete in his uh, works. And of course, he mentions the increased size of the, the armies, the longer lasting conflicts. We can mention the Thirty Years' War in that regard. And uh, these changes would eventually, these military changes would press social uh, changes because society needs to uphold this uh, army, needs to uh, work to, to sustain this army, both in population and both uh, in uh, material. And uh, of course, this needs a more centralized uh, government, a more stronger centralized government unification. And therefore, uh, he mentions that it is a key point in development of absolutism of the 17th slash 18th century in Europe. So it presses social and political changes in the continent. Now, when he published his work, there was no major debate uh, surrounding it. Uh, one of the reasons was that there was, there was not a, a major dominance of military history at that time period. The main focus was in historical writings were most an economic uh, history that was the most popular and therefore uh, for a couple of years uh, or almost 20 years there were no major debates surrounding Michael Roberts's work. Now before we move forward into the uh, debate section, uh, I would mention Fernand Brodel's uh, publication because Brodel can be identified as the theory before the theory because he published his book in 1949 and he mentions that uh, the changes and development is very important in Europe because of the changes of firearms and artillery uh, development. So Basically, we can mention that Brodel was the uh, theory before the, the theory, but of course Michael Roberts could not, uh, not, not, could not necessarily draw his theory from thin air. He basically had uh, works to, to work from, uh, to, to have a basis of which he comprised his own uh, long-lasting theory of military revolution, but I felt it was necessary to mention Fernand Brodel as one of the longer-lasting effects and one of the major uh, figures of the, of the mid-20th century. Now, when the academic debate starts, as I mentioned, it was in the mid-1970s, mid to late 1970s, but it's mostly uh, reaches a certain level in the 1980s and in 1990s. So Geoffrey Parker uh, publishes his work in 1976. Immediately, he confutes Roberts uh, in, in his early publication, as I mentioned, that uh, Roberts should not focus on only the Northern European uh, parts, should not only focus on the Swedish and the uh, Dutch model. He mentions that the Catholic Habsburg armies were not inferior to these Northern European uh, ideas. He mentions the Spanish and the German uh, armed forces. And uh, he mentions that, that the focusing on the Swedish and the Dutch military reforms is a kind of a Protestant narrative that derives from the, the Protestant uh, traditions. Uh, we, should, we should view the Catholic side as well, as also it had competent leaders, uh, competent military theoreticians, and also it would also have certain changes. And these armies were effective. Uh, we can see this effectiveness in the religious wars in Europe, the Schmalkaldic War and the Thirty Years' War uh, as well. He also expanded the period up to the first half of the 16th century and pushed it out to the early 18th century, so when the standing armies would develop in the 18th century. And he also mentions that the fortress building is very important and vital in this regard. The new Italian style fortresses are key in, in military revolution period because it changes, again, warfare in a certain bit, that it changes the, the face of the sieges and the campaigns uh, as well. In 1988, he did his rework, 
and uh, he talked about Western Europe's dominance uh, within the within this uh, framework, and which had the elements of military revolution, which he, he regarded as military revolution, uh, were the of course the dominant Western European powers, and which have not. He he just uh, mentioned it as resistant areas or resistance to uh, changes and and certain developments. But uh, his work, as I mentioned, had four editions until 2018, so it's a very important key uh, academic work in that uh, regard. Michael Duffy further expands this uh, question into the Ottoman Wars, which Agostin Gabor again uh, worked thoroughly in the, in the recent years. David Parrott in the 1980s also mentions that the Dutch and Swedish centric theory definitely needs a rework because it was much more widespread than the than the northern European uh, parts. And uh, in the 1990s, we see the next larger wave of debates. This is where you saw that within a couple of years, a lot of publications were uh, given. There is the military revolution debate from 1995, which confutes actually Parker's 1967 uh, uh, work. And then uh, there is Rothenberg's uh, work, who mentions the example of Montecu Corisso, an Austrian imperial general, who is a military theoretician and who was a long-lasting figure in the changes of the imperial armies and also European warfare uh, as well. And of course, time and space needs further uh, expansion in his works. Now let's just move to a little bit eastward to, to Central Europe, which mostly these works would, would call collectively Eastern Europe, but uh, let's just try to focus on the Central European uh, aspects. Now, I mentioned a quote here from, uh, from Robert Frost from 2000, uh, and I quote, if East European methods were backward, they were remarkably effective. Which he, this, this is he mentioned in 2000, because uh, it was a question, a matter of debate, whether or not Eastern Europe slash Hungary, Poland, Russia, and, and everything that is uh, eastward uh, actually had a military revolution or not. Most of these earlier academic works says that they did not actually, so they were more uh, obsolete and backward, mostly medieval-based armies, uh, as they mentioned them. Uh, before we tackle this question, I would ju just like to mention another matter of debate. Can we call this actually a military revolution or not? Because, yeah, it is an, uh, also an academic debate, because if we take a look at the longest period, this, this is a 300 years long slash revolution. So if you know the definition of revolution, meaning a radical change in a shorter time period, then this definitely does not fit into a revolution. Radical change nonetheless, but 300 years are 300 years, so it's a long time. And um, this is why Clifford J. Rogers uh, mentions that this is not a revolution, more likely a, a so-called punctuated equilibrium, meaning a more natural evolution uh, of development in the military uh, weaponry, military tactics of the early modern period. Uh, Jeremy Black also debates the revolution idea. He most likely in favor of the, the theory that this was mostly a, a, a series of consequent revolutions. So he mentions uh, a couple of them that were continuing and were building on each other from the 14th up to the 18th century. So first they had the infantry revolution, then the art, uh, artillery revolution, the fortress uh, building revolution, revolution of firearms, and finally the revolution within the size of the armies. So it's just basically a bundle of revolutions that are very close to each other, uh, connected to uh, each other. Therefore, it shows a longer uh, change of the of the three, three or four hundred years that were mentioned. Now, what about the dominance of the West? It is also a very interesting question, especially from Central European perspective. Uh, luckily, we also had advocates uh, on our part from, from the uh, Anglo uh, sphere. Now, immediately we could mention Robert Frost, but also Roberts and Parker mentions that the revolution happens in Western and Northern Europe, and uh, Central and Eastern Europe were backwards and obsolete uh, because we use medieval style cavalry, there was a lack of modern firearms and were no uh, modern Italian style fortresses or star fortresses present in the area. Uh, questions that are very interesting to, to address later on. Robert Frost, who the person who mentions this, uh, I mentioned this quote from, uh, immediately brings up the example of the Polish-Lithuanian uh, Commonwealth uh, in 1994. 
He says that the Pol Poland Lithuania constantly adapted to the new changes and the new uh, adversaries it faced during the time period. So developments of firearms were definitely present even in the late Middle Ages. Uh, artillery development was present during the late Middle Ages up to the early modern period. And of course, new military units were established uh, in the time frame uh, which is analyzed. Uh, we also know the existence of Western military books, treatises, uh, theoretical works that were part of the Polish Lithuanian monarchs' library of the early modern uh, period. We also know the developments, the military reforms under the Polish kings, so Sigismund Augustus, Stephen Bathory, for example, I'm getting a strong advocate for this part, and of course Vladislav IV also had uh, military developments during their reign. Now, he tackled the question of the lack of fortresses because uh, one of the questions that Poland and Lithuania did not have any major uh, Italian style uh, star fortresses uh, in their uh, territory. The problem is logistics because you cannot compare the comprised uh, space of, of the Netherlands with the broader plains of, of uh, Ukraine or, 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 the, or the Polish plain uh, or the Lithuanian plain because that's a, it's a much more wider space, it needs a lot more material and of course you need to maintain those fortresses otherwise they would become only more, uh, more expensive to, to, to maintain and they will become basically isolated and then overall uh, eventually destroyed. You had major fortresses, of course, in the border sections. Kamenias Podolski is a perfect example for this. But mostly we talk about fortified villages and fortified settlements because it that these were uh, actually enough because the enemy was different. Uh, Poland and Lithuania did not face uh, French armies, Spanish armies in, in that region. Uh, mostly it faced either Ottoman armies or Tatar incursions uh, from the south and the southeast. And these were not very, let's just say, gunpowder heavy uh, people, referring to the Tartars mostly. Uh, so these were mostly light cavalry uh, raiding parties that would uh, go inside. Uh, this means that the, the fortified villages were more, uh, most likely enough for this uh, uh, endeavor. And of course, these territories were easy to capture but difficult to hold, so they could be recaptured easily. So the lack of lack of these major, large, huge fortress systems uh, is actually a logical decision. And of course, the cavalry focus is also necessary because, again, you have large uh, marshy terrains and large plains uh, in that area. If we take a look at the uh, Polish and Russian uh, wars, uh, you can see that they cover a lot of distance uh, in, a, in a very, very uh, ill terrain uh, that would be well, detrimental to, to heavy infantry, so Spanish-style tercios were, were not very uh, keen on those uh, terrains, but, but a cavalry-focused army was much, much more convenient for, for that area. They could cover a lot of ground, and of course they could take up the fight against the, again, heavy, very cavalry-heavy uh, opponents such as the Tartars or the, or the Ottomans. So uh, the cavalry focus was actually a logical and necessary uh, step. So immediately Frost says that we should analyze the military revolution, but we should, of course, build up the context in which we analyze it. What are the circumstances that a certain country needs to face and needs to answer to? So this is why it is a very important change in the uh, thinking of military revolution. As I mentioned, it's, he's a strong advocate in the Central European uh, part. Now, I mentioned Poland briefly, but what about Hungary and Transylvania? Did actually military revolution happened in this country, these countries as well. Um, in regard of fortresses, we, should, we could mention that there were definitely border fortresses. There were definitely a chain work of border fortresses uh, in Hungary. Uh, this was the key to sur the survival of the country uh, and, of course, of the empire as well. Uh, and we also had uh, Italian and Dutch architects working on these uh, fortresses. So because of the imperial connections, Hungary had access to the modern uh, fortress building methods. The question was, of course, money. Fortress building is very expensive. And of course, the material and the surroundings and, of course, time, because uh, Ottoman campaigns and Ottoman incursions happened quite often. So you also need to pull up uh, not, not very modern fortresses as well, not very developed fortresses as well, but you definitely can find examples of, of uh, Italian uh, style fortresses in the uh, Hungarian territory uh, as well. The most important was, of course, 
Dürr was also very well developed, Fortress City, uh, Sigetvar was also well developed, uh, Fortress despite it was very difficult to defend, uh, Ershek Uyvar uh, is also, uh, uh, which you can see a picture here, is also quite uh, modern, so uh, there were actually uh, implementations of this modern Italian and Dutch style uh, fortress building, but of course circumstances and uh, financial reasons were a big uh, factor also in the development of these. So we can see less modern fortresses, but we can also see modern fortresses as well. So a bit of a hybrid uh, as to, to mention. Uh, there's definitely firearms development in uh, in Hungary as well. So the both the Transylvanian princes and both the, the Hungarian uh, armies are, ha are having access to, to firearms, either through their own development because of the German population living there, because of the gunsmiths that are functioning in their cities, and also through the connections, especially in the case of the Kingdom of Hungary, which was part of the uh, Habsburg territories. Uh, there were connections to, to modern uh, firearm development uh, as well. So we can definitely see firearm-based uh, troops. And uh, of course, we can see uh, Western-style armies in Hungary, Spanish uh, mercenaries, Flandrian, Walloon uh, mercenaries, who brought the, the Western and Northern European style of warfare with them. And it is actually very important because it means that the uh, types of troops the Kingdom of Hungary could uh, put out uh, complemented the heavier, slower style of warfare that the empire could uh, give up, meaning that it would be a very well-balanced uh, army overall with light, mobile troops and with the heavy, hard-hitting, uh, heavy infantry and heavy cavalry uh, as well, with lots of, sorry, lots of artillery and, and uh, firearms as well. Of course, Hungary also needed to adapt to the Ottoman enemy, mostly. These were the primary enemies of the of the nation, of the of the uh, realm, and uh, the, the several raids and counter raids were implemented, uh, which Hungarians also needed to answer. So this is the reason why they needed a highly mobile force, highly mobile army, not just to defend the fortress areas, but also defend the this entire uh, border section of the Hungarian uh, kingdom. This is why also they recognized lighter cavalry uh, tactics. And uh, these lighter cavalry tactics were actually quite important and quite uh, fascinating for Western European uh, military leaders and military theoreticians. And what we can see is that Hungarian light cavalry or Hungarian cavalry and uh, uh, infantry are recognized and implemented in Western Europe uh, during the Thirty Years' War and even during the War of Spanish Succession in the early uh, 18th century. So we can see the importance and the, the complementive nature of the of the Hungarian development. I'm not saying that they were the state of the art troops, of course, as well. So we can see of uh, see uh, financial issues, but overall we can definitely see a strong evolution and uh, a, a very important element in the European military framework, which Hungary and also poor, of course Poland and Lithuania uh, presented in the 16th and 17th uh, century. Now we can reach the second half of the lecture. Can we identify military revolution as a sort of cultural transfer? Now, what is actually cultural transfer? Um, of course, it is a very universal uh, term to analyze. Uh, the definition mentions, mentions an exchange of ideas, language, concepts, objects, art, etc., between groups of people in contact with each other. So this means religious groups, certain countries or ethnicities living very close or in contact uh, uh, with each other. For this, you would definitely need a so-called contact zone and uh, agents of exchange. So for this, transfer would uh, develop. And uh, this also shows a so-called mobility of concepts, so-called traveling uh, concept. So not the culture is exchanged, but the, but the, but the concept uh, itself is exchanged and implemented in certain ways into different uh, groups mutually. Uh, as well. We can see language, religion as a sort of cultural transfer, uh, clothing, um, food, types of foods, music, uh, anything else we can see as cultural transfer, use of language we can see as cultural transfer. Why not the uh, military development uh, as a cultural transfer? Uh, we, can, we also have some publications regarding this. And um, it, the, the positive side of, of this whole analysis of cultural transfer shows that uh, we, can, we can view things within a heterogeneous cultural network. So we're not just only focusing on, for example, 
Polish military history, Hungarian military history, German military history, but Central European military history or European uh, military history within certain uh, topics. So it uh, it it comprises a very interesting uh, focus point of the analysis, which is not uh, limited by certain border uh, areas. For this, I would like to mention Central Europe as a basic case study. Uh, if you go back, I mentioned the contact zones and the agents of exchange. Now, in this regard, I would like to mention two examples, the Hussars and the Hajduks, the cavalry and the light infantry of the early modern period. Now, we can identify these especially as results of local military revolution or evolution. Uh, this is also uh, confirmed by uh, academics academics who publish these works regarding centuries military um, changes and definitely the the hussar framework is not a medieval style so it is not based on the knights as uh, just so the heavy heavy lancers of the medieval medieval period it is an answer an early modern answer to a new threat especially an ottoman and tartar focused threat of the uh, central and eastern european uh, areas so it's it becomes a new branch of the military which has to feel fit in the role of the later the medieval style cavalry but also has to fit in a role of a much newer uh, threat a much newer challenge so it's a much more uh, well-rounded type of cavalry in the early modern period and the high dukes were, they were definitely a firearm based uh, uh, infantry and uh, their high mobility is also very important in their function as guarding the fortresses as harassing the enemy and just to have a higher mobility uh, skirmishing light infantry in this area both of these units, both of these types of, of, of soldiers have their own specialized tactics, have their uh, firearms in a certain amount. And also they are sought by European powers. Hungarian Hussars were present in the Schmalkaldic War in the first half of the uh, 16th uh, century. You can also see uh, Hungarian and uh, Serbian Hussars present in Poland in the early 16th century. So there's definitely mobility and an interest in, in mercenary work for these types of, of cavalries. And of course, as I mentioned, the uh, high dukes were also used in the uh, 16th, 17th century and to as a uh, Haidu regiment, uh, they were also used in the 18th century, but they were mostly mostly referred to as in name as Haidu uh, regiments, but the traditions were still uh, honored in that way. We have the contact zone in this case because uh, Hungary, Poland, and Lithuania, even Bohemia, were in a personal union uh, during the 15th and 16th century, during the Jagiellonian period, especially in the late Middle Ages. But of course, uh, during Batory's reign, again, you had a personal union which provided a very good contact zone for, for this sort of uh, transfer between the military ideas and, and methods. Uh, we also had the agents of transfer. These were the monarchs who implemented these new types of, of changes, reforms, types of soldiers, Batory's, uh, for example, Batory's work in reforming the Polish-Lithuanian army is vital in that case. And he based his uh, reforms on Hungarian Transylvanian traditions uh, of of his time period. He brought with himself the retinue of, of cavalry and Hajduks as well, which were the core of the uh, of his new uh, army. And then uh, the types of weaponry and, and soldiers were implemented into, into his new uh, country as well. So definitely there, he, he could function as an agent of transfer uh, as well. And also the mercenary work is, can be seen as a sort of uh, transfer of cultures because we have groups of people uh, providing their own specialty and uh, weaponry and knowledge to different countries. We can either mention uh, the, the connection between uh, Hungary and, and Poland and Bohemia, but we can also mention this between a vast wider variety because between, uh, for example, Hungary and Western Europe. And also we can also see a cultural transfer between the Ottoman Empire and Hungary as well. And Hungary could focus as a middleman because the Ottoman connections could then go into the Polish-Lithuanian style as well. So here, Im immediately we can see a large framework here, which is can be interpreted as a sort of military cultural transfer. Now let's get on to the uh, exact uh, examples at the end of our lecture. So the Hussar uh, history, uh, just a brief history because that would be a separate uh, lecture on, again in and, of, in and of itself. Now the uh, Hussars were implemented uh, and used in a wider range in, in the 15th century uh, in Hungary. 
the origins of Hussars, I would not, not like to go into that debate because that can get it, get myself into a heated this, uh, discussion and debate. But I would what I like to mention is that the early style of Hussars uh, of the late medieval period, so the 15th century and the early 16th century, were a type of light cavalry. This, these were also called as the Rats style. Rats is the contemporary reference to the Serbian of that time period. The rat style of Hussars did not have any armor on. So you can see an illustration here. And here we can see the Polish illustration uh, as well. No armor whatsoever. Instead, they have their shields and uh, they have the lances. So they mostly focus on mobility and uh, f flexibility and the speed of which they can break their lances into the enemy uh, ranks and then pull away from them. So not much of a protection, but high mobility uh, as well. This is typical from the uh, late 15th and early uh, 16th century. Sorry if you hear a little bit of a, a drilling. That's probably a couple of my neighbors doing some refurbishing, but I hope it's not very uh, disturbing. So this is an early uh, 16th century variant of these uh, hussars that were very popular in that time. But by the mid 16th century up to the late 16th century, we can see a so-called armored hussar uh, variant that was also present in, in Hungary uh, as well uh, around the time of, of Bathory's life and uh, reign. Here we can see a contemporary illustration of, of this uh, type of hussar. And this is a, actually a very good reconstruction uh, illustration of a so-called uh, armored hussar or heavy hussar of the 16th and early 17th uh, century. Here we can see key elements. So they were definitely lancers. Uh, they were also armored compared to the uh, rats, so the uh, lighter hussars. They leave the shields behind them because of uh, an extra weight that they can leave behind them. But uh, they have a lot of weapons uh, with them, mostly melee weapons. But later on, they would develop also firearms uh, with them. The helmet and the breastplate is very important because both the uh, so-called rákfarka shishak or the lobster-tailed helmet is very typical uh, in Hungary, transferred from the Ottoman uh, territories used in Hungary, then goes up to, to Poland as well. But it's also used in Western Europe by the uh, dragoons and heavy cavalry of uh, Germany, England, Northern Europe. So it's a very, very popular helmet design of the early modern period. And the segmented breastplate is very important because it... Uh, allows some sort of source of flexibility and mobility to the rider. And in contemporary sources, German sources, this is called either Hussar, uh, Hussar breast or Hungarian breast, Ungarische Brust, in the, in the contemporary uh, sources. So this is what they different, the, typically call the Hungarian uh, thing in uh, Central uh, Europe. Of course, we can see the saber as used, the conchers, the hegesteros, and also the heavier broadsword that was used by these cavalrymen. Now, if you take a look at the Polish variant, the Husaria from the 16th and 18th century, we can see this, these are the heavier configurations. So they put on even more types of armors, such as uh, thigh protection and even more arm protection. So they were the heaviest types of, of Hussars in the early modern period. But they would adapt the Hungarian style uh, segmented breastplate or semi-segmented breastplate. And of course, uh, for this, we can see uh, Stephen Bathory's uh, half-segmented Hussar armor uh, from the time period, which could actually function as the basis of the later uh, uh, Hussar designs of the 17th uh, century. So Bathory's military reforms were important, not just for the structure of the military, but also the overall aesthetic and look of the uh, Hussars of Poland and Lithuania in the 16th, 17th century. Not only the uh, elements were implemented, but also some of the words were implemented from Hungarian to, to Polish, such as the helmet was referred to as Shishak. Again, Shishak is helmet in, in Hungarian. The Karvashe, or the Karvash, meaning arm, iron, uh, was the, of course, the arm protection. And the Shabla or the Sabia was, of course, the saber. Again, uh, Pol uh, the Polish uh, memory refers to these type of sabers, Bathory saber, because it was uh, implemented during Bathory's uh, reign and rule. And uh, what is very important uh, about these Hussars is that they use shock tactics. So they are not doing the caracol. They are not uh, focusing on only on firearms and pistols and carbines, but they are lancers. So they charge into the uh, enemy, trying to break their ranks. And uh, actually, they fought against Western-style armies. So they fought against Swedes. They fought against 
all types of enemies, not just Tartars and uh, or Russians or or Turks, but also, as I mentioned, Swedes uh, as well. And they were quite successful against the Swedish armies uh, as well. Uh, of suffered defeats but also gained tremendous victories because of their tactics and Gustavus Adolfus in his younger years were present on the Polish frontier and he was defeated uh, quite a bit uh, during his campaigns and he recognized the style of the the hussars uh, are using and he was in high uh, holding them in high esteem that this is how cavalry tactics should be used and he implemented these sort of hussar tactics into his own cavalry basically building up a hybrid of the western style uh, of cavalry warfare with the polish uh, style of cavalry warfare also another german general pappenheim uh, a famous cavalry commander of the 30 years who were present uh, also saw the polish hussars in action and he also mentioned that this is how cavalry should be used on the battlefield not as, as how we uh, do it so Immediately, we can see the influence from Central European to the Western development in the within the military revolution uh, framework. So shock tactics were very important and were used to full effect in the mid to late uh, 16th century, 17th century uh, in other armies as well in Western Europe. Now, this is where we have a change because the P Polish uh, hussars would remain as a sort of heavy lancer in the in the late uh, 16th, 17th century as well. But in Hungary, uh, we go back to the lighter uh, tactics. So around the time of the Thirty Years' War, uh, hussars would have less or no armor whatsoever. Again, going to full on the uh, mobility of these uh, horse uh, troops. But of course, we can see the increasing role of firearms. So Hungarian hussars have a lot of pistols, so at least two pistols with them and a carbine with them, and a saber and a long uh, conchers, so a longer sword piercing weapon with them that could combat uh, enemy armor as well, and the saber for close uh, melee uh, combat as well. So again, uh, the Hungarian version uh, focuses more on mobility, but also on firepower and of course high uh, mobility, as I mentioned, and, and a well-rounded nature uh, of it. Lances were not preferred in Hungary in the second half of the 17th century, although we could find some. Uh, Miklós Zrínyi, a military theoretician and, and uh, commander, uh, detested lances, for example. He said they were obsolete and useless now uh, in battle. Um, and of course, this will become the so-called Hungarian style of hussar. When I mention Hungarian hussar, most of you probably would, would uh, picture this type of Hussar and this is what was implemented into Western armies after the Rakotsi uh, uprising. So these types of Hussars were present in the 18th and the 19th century. So we had that sort of high influence on, on Western Europe and Eastern Europe as, uh, as well. Overall, to conclude uh, my lecture, I want to just answer a bit openly answer the two major questions I, I, I asked in the beginning. Was there any military revolution or evolution in Central Europe? We can say yes, but we can also, we must analyze this in accordance with the regional challenges. Of course, uh, Hungarians will never be famous because of their pike formations, as uh, Zrinyi, for example, even Diamond of Rakotsi, Willen, they mentioned that the Hungarians are, are unfit to use tightly packed pike formations and pike and shot, uh, shot tactics. Uh, but we'll definitely need a so-called modernization. But overall, uh, we when the cavalry tactics and the light infantry tactics, there were definitely a strong evolution uh, in Hungary. In Poland, you can also see the development of firearms and, and cavalry-based uh, tactics, which were fit to the challenges of that time period. Fortresses were built on both sides in suiting their own uh, framework, their own challenges. They also had military theoreticians, the knowledge of military theoretical works as well, and military districts as well. So this, uh, these are very important key elements of uh, the definition of military uh, reforms. And the second question, can elements of military revolution be seen as cultural transfer? I would say yes. So both within Central Europe, we can see um, a cultural transfer between the parts of, uh, of Central Europe. As I mentioned, Poland, Lithuania uh, was a, a very, uh, and Hungary were a very good uh, example, and Transylvania as uh, well. Um, but of course, between Central and Western Europe as well, because uh, both influenced each other during the 16th and 17th uh, century. Hussars and Haiduks were very important, or not very important, but they are very important in, uh, not to deteriorate them, but they were very important in Western conf conflicts because they complemented the, the heavier, uh, slower based uh, infantry and cavalry, which was vital, and light cavalry became the pinnacle of cavalry in, in the later time period, slowly but surely uh, drawing out uh, heavy cavalry tactics in the 19th century. Uh, 
this the signs of, of cultural transfer we can see definitely by the style of clothing, uh, the weaponry and equipment, the names, the language, the, the phrases that were used between these certain uh, countries, and of course the royal military reforms within a personal unions, very important signs of a sort of cultural transfer that were present and of course the cultural history is very important on both sides because whenever i talk to to a polish person he mentions the battery period he mentions the hussars and um, that's definitely a very strong uh, cultural memory connection between the uh, two uh, countries as well but of course if we talk about the hussars with with another foreign person he also mentions their their style of hussars in in their own uh, time period and, and frame framework so central europe definitely had a part in in military revolution bohemia i didn't mention bohemia because bohemia is very uh, strongly present in the in the mercenary style so the infantry based uh, warfare he also they also used the, the tercio style so they had the western style again so bohemia was definitely influenced by the imperial style of, of warfare so that's a much more clear uh, example the more debated one here was of course uh, hungary and, and poland and, and lithuania and with that, I would not like to draw up the time much more. I would like to thank you for your attention, and I hope I could uh, give some uh, interesting insight of this uh, very fascinating topic, maybe some clarification of the definition, or overall, uh, you enjoyed the lecture. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you a lot for such an interesting lecture. And uh, I think that uh, it will be interesting to more people and it will be on YouTube. And once again, thank you. Really very good lecture, very interesting. And even for those one who uh, doesn't know nothing about military history as I am, it was very interesting and fascinating lecture. Thank you. Thank you much. I try my best to be as least boring as possible. So I, I'm glad that uh, you and all of others uh, enjoyed it.